bent of you know how to hit the center of the target with uh, DBS for movement disorders here. Um, I think that how to do that uh, really varies uh, depending upon which institution you're at, what kind of training you've had, um, and I don't think anybody, again, has the right answer for everybody. Um, but uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Francisco Ponce talk to us next um, uh, about sleep versus awake DBS as, a, as another way to try to hit the center of that target. Um, he did his uh, uh, medical training at University of Chicago, then neurosurgery training at Barrow, um, did a uh, fellowship in serotactic functional neurosurgery with Dr. Lozano up in Toronto, and then now has uh, come back to Barrow and is the director of the Neuromodulation Center since uh, 2011. He is probably, uh, aside from Dr. Birchall, one of the biggest proponents or has done the most uh, asleep DBS um, and is going to talk to us today about that. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks. Uh, I think that was a good flow. Uh, I think it's better following uh, uh, Peter's talk like this because he really sets things up talking about the background for DBS uh, disclosures. I'm going to talk about off-label use. The cl there's a clause in the FDA approval for DBS that requires successful intraoperative test stimulation. So technically, from that point of view, Medtronic does not promote a sleep DBS because based on FDA paperwork, uh, it's considered off-label. Um, they're revisiting that. So I'm going to talk about DBS in 2015, uh, principles of what a sleep is. It's not all about general anesthesia. And then uh, talk about some outcomes with, uh, with, with this. Um, the future is neuromodulation. So this is what kind of sucked me into uh, DBS surgery and uh, functional neurosurgery. Uh, I went to Barrow playing to clip and coil aneurysms. Uh, you know, Robert Spetzer was my hero, still is. And during my third and fourth years, Lozano and uh, Ali Rizai came through. Um, the, uh, this was around the time of the de depression work. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd go to these, you know, re resident uh, breakfast seminars at CNS and WNS, and you'd have all these chairmen, and when talking about the future of neurosurgery, they're like, neuromodulation, neuromodulation. So I was the first one to really take the bait. Uh, for this, and uh, so middle of my fourth year, I contacted Lozano and set that up. Um, but there's a lot of excitement about this, uh, looking at new indications, things like well, there's an Alzheimer's trial at the end of uh, probably in May. We'll probably hear about how the uh, Alzheimer's trial went uh, after one year of double blind uh, depression, Tourette syndrome. Uh, and really, it's about kind of going away from structural anatomy to connectivity, to circuitry, and how we can modulate these circuits and the role of circuits in uh, neurological disease. Uh, so far as Parkinson's go, uh, there's, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that this is the highest impact therapy for Parkinson's since levodopa. And that was 1968 that levodopa came out. This is a patient diary. Uh, you can see, uh, I'll use the mouse here since we've got three, uh, six screens. 7 AM to midnight, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, and you have the medication regimen. So this is a patient diary. This is how patients kind of document how they're doing with Parkinson's disease. So on means that their symptoms are well controlled. Off is like being off medication. You, you've got your Parkinson's. Uh, so people can be on but with dyskinesias, but they'd rather be wiggling around than frozen and stiff and rigid. Uh, so this illustrates this concept of motor fluctuations on and off with intermittent dyskinesias. Uh, so patients end up having to take medication more and more. And this is actually stuff, when I went to Toronto, I was not really clued into this idea of where DBS comes into uh, uh, the therapy for, for Parkinson's disease. Uh, so these fluctuations and the dyskinesias, those became the major drivers of disability uh, in Parkinson's after this you know, initial miracle of a levodopa medication. So uh, there's been good data that basically shows what the expected benefits are. It kind of captures those best responses from medication with, uh, with levodopa medication stabilizes it so more on time without the dis troublesome dyskinesias. And this really came to light in the uh, Weaver study, the, the JAMA study that, uh, that Dr. Nora showed, where on average patients gained 4.6 hours, actually closer to five when actually looking at who was treated, of on time without troublesome dyskinesias. And they saw better motor function, uh, better quality of life. It's safe, it's non-destructive, it's reversible, it's adjustable. Over 130,000, I keep having to increase this number. Uh, the big, it was a couple years ago that uh, we hit the 100,000 uh, mark. But um, a lot of patients have undergone this surgery, so we have a good track record of safety and efficacy. Uh, it's estimated that between 10 and 15, maybe even up to 20% of Parkinson's patients are candidates. However, only 2% are uh, receiving DBS. 
uh, the penetrance is even lower with the central tremor. So Medicaid, uh, Medicare Services, CMS, has actually identified this therapy as being underutilized, unlike some of the other things we see, like spine fusions and whatnot. So this is an underutilized therapy. The practice of DBS is lagging behind where the, what the evidence suggests. Uh, and this is something that Dr. Norris said too. This is not experimental. It's not a treatment of last resort. You don't wait until the patient's in dire straits. You say, all right, let's throw in the towel. Let's do surgery. In fact, there was a study that came out of Europe, uh, about, I think it's been about two years now, looking at early stimulation, capturing these, the average age in the study was uh, early 50s. Uh, and this was STN stimulation. And at the end of this randomized trial, everybody who'd been randomized to med medical therapy elected to proceed with STN uh, DBS after this trial. So we're really, this is where I was kind of coming into a practice in 2011, uh, that we're ready for prime time here. Uh, the evidence is so strong, this is a great therapy, and uh, there's actually, you know, there's kind of a, a gospel of DBS that you can go around talking to neurologists about. And I think one of the things here is that we're not talking about cancer, we're not talking, you know, the stakes are a little bit higher in some regard because this is not something that's going to kill you if you don't get the surgery, unlike glioblastoma, which is going to kill you anyway. But uh, you're not like, well, it's brain surgery, you know, it's baseball, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna win some, you're going to lose some. Uh, one bad outcome can really change how a neurologist includes DBS in their practice. So I'm going to talk a little bit about dumbing this operation down, but the reality is this operation, it's like 120 steps, and you've got to nail each one of those steps to get a good outcome. You don't want wound dehiscence. You don't want, there's little things that, you know, we, we accept with, you know, a spine case or something that, you, that there's very little tolerance in DBS for. So why are patients not flocking to get this operation done? It's brain surgery. There's risks of operation, and you can't consent a patient for this operation without saying death, coma, stroke, paralysis, infection. Uh, fear of awake surgery. Uh, implanted hardware, the self-image. You know, you have a big battery in your chest. So you look at the, bat the Activa PC battery, and they're like, oh, that's pretty big. And then, you know, being framed for four, four to six hours. And somebody who's in their early 50s, kind of in their prime, they're in good control. And, you know, are they going to wait until they're a little bit more disabled before they get this therapy? Uh, do they, you know, so I think this loss of control is also an issue. Uh, some guys in town in Phoenix uh, said that they used to refer to this as the eight-hour burr hole. And that's why uh, they're another hospital system, but they welcomed me coming into that system to do DBS. Um, so there are a lot of steps that take place. The one that's most variable is the microelectrode recording. Uh, and some places spend hours doing this. I think the uh, time requirements for a microelectrode recording is very variable depending upon uh, the, the surgeon, depending upon the institution and the team. So why have we been doing this operation the way we've done it, uh, you know, with the MRI, with the recordings, test stimulation, having the patient off medication? Well, keep in mind, a lot of what, the way this operation is done uh, today, traditionally, is very similar to how it was being done in the early 90s. And at that time, we had limited MRI. We're basing our targeting on three cadavers that had been dissected in France you know, 50 years ago. And um, you know, we kind of had to really make sure, and a big part here to keep in mind, is that a lot of these techniques for DBS were adopted from the ablative era. So in the 1980s, they were still doing thalamotomies. In the 90s, they were doing pallidotomies. So before you destroy a part of the brain, you want to check, double check, triple check that you're in the right place because you're, you're not going to be able to unring that bell. So that history of the technique for DBS uh, kind of informs a lot about why we do it the way we do it. So I, I have a, another talk where I basically uh, go point by point through all these uh, aspects of awake surgery uh, in an attempt to kind of uh, take it down. Uh, but one, one question is, is it time to dumb down the operation, make it a procedure, or, is it, or do we want to soup it up? And we're actually doing both. Because, because this works so well for Parkinson's, we're learning a lot about circuitry. We're learning a lot about what's in these circuits, local field potentials. There are responsive uh, stimulators that we're looking at. You know, Neuropace is a responsive stimulator. But also now they have, um, uh, they're looking at closing the loop, basically, having batteries that can take information from the brain to inform how to stimulate more effectively. Uh, we are, we're also looking at connectivity with anatomical connectivity, DTI, diffusion tensor imaging, also functional neuroimaging. So there's a lot of things that we're using to see how this can be applied to Parkinson's disease, DBS. But I think the real interest is to get that scientific foundation to approach other diseases like 
cognitive disorders and depression. Because the bottom line is we know this works, and it works very well for movement disorders. So I'm not sure to what degree all these, uh, these kind of new aspects of uh, uh, these new technologies are going to be adopted for, uh, for Parkinson's DBS. So I kind of half jokingly say, you know, it's time to take the science out of this. This is a brain pacemaker. We think about heart pacemakers. People are diagnosed with arrhythmias and say, all right, go get the pacemaker uh, if medication doesn't work. And similarly, I want to get patients in and out of surgery and back in the game. And uh, just like we're talking about the, uh, the patient with the uh, laser ablation, you know, I've had patients come in on, on Friday. They go back to work on Monday, even though I tell them not to. Um, but people can tolerate this operation very well. If you make this operation into the eight-hour burr hole, they're going to be exhausted. Multiple brain penetrations can affect their cognition, and the recovery will be longer. So uh, a sleep DBS, general anesthesia is not a, neither a necessary nor sufficient condition for sleep. This is really combining two principles. One is the principle of direct targeting that Dr. Nora addressed, and the other is the availability and use of intraoperative imaging. So direct targeting, uh, Dr. Nora showed a picture similar to this, where you can start with sort of atlas-based consensus coordinates and refine that uh, target based upon what you see on MRI. That's a, a T2 FSC MRI. Uh, this is the uh, so-called F-Gator, a specific sequence developed at University of Florida to image the globus pallidus. Uh, you can see here, this is the internal capsule right there. There's the anterior commissure, fornix. Uh, this line right there is the border between the GPE, GPI, and there's a little lamina right within the GPI that you can see pretty consistently uh, in a, in a well-done MRI. And we combine this with the information done by Phil Starr, looking at sort of the optimal position within the GPI for, uh, for dystonia. And you can match that structure, that, that area of the GPI in the mid commissural plane on the MRI. And that's, that would be my direct target. One thing that's key about this is that, you know, keeping in mind what the consensus coordinates were, right? 21 millimeters lateral, 2 millimeters anterior, 4 millimeters down. That's a generic target for GPI. Well, GPI, there's a lot of variability in terms of where this is located. This patient, their GPI, their, their target would be 24.6 millimeters lateral. This one's 18. You know, that's. 17, seven millimeters is like a mile when you're doing microelectric recording. So you can see why they needed to do that check, double check, triple checking, because they couldn't see the internal capsule. They couldn't see the structures within the GPI. So we use direct targeting. We combine it with intraoperative imaging. This is the serotome. Uh, it's a portable CT scanner. Uh, my asleep DBS was like poor man's DBS. We had like three Lexel frames. We had this portable CT scanner gathering dust in the ICU. Uh, because we, we, we bought it for uh, unstable patients in the ICU, and we brought down the OR and started doing this. And so you, so you can see the patients under general anesthesia, they're with a Lexel frame. The placement of the Lexel frame, the flow can be pretty smooth under an asleep patient. You're not worried as much about you know, adequate blocks. Anesthesiologists like this because they don't have to worry about airway protection once the tube is in. There's the uh, registration of the stereotactic frame. Uh, I can actually, I actually use my uh, iPhone to level the frame, making sure that it's uh, perfectly flat. Uh, the, uh, the body tome, uh, the, uh, the other hospital that I, that I do the surgery in with uh, uh, no residents, just myself, uh, they got this body tome, which is a full GAN for a portable, portable CT scanner. And um, they bought this for the spine guys there. And so I started using this for DBS. And this is nice because you can actually place the, uh, the entire Lexol frame uh, you can, uh, with the arc and everything. And I'll show a picture of that. You register the frame. Uh, this is kind of a video kind of showing all those steps again. Here's the frame. Patient's asleep. Uh, much easier to put the frame on in this setting. It's not too bad with it out. The, the patient's kind of, it's the same situation when I do it awake as well. The patient's knocked out with propofol. And one thing I like about this is that we're not moving the patient in the frame. The patient's in the same position they're in for the MRI, for the CT scan, for the lead placement. There's no head of bed up and no risk that this frame moves, transporting the patient from MRI back to OR. Here's the targeting. I started off using um, next frame for the first uh, about 10 months of uh, sleep, and then I went back to Lexel. Uh, it, I was able to save an hour of overall OR time uh, with the uh, less preparation required uh, with a Lexel frame. This is actually a, where we, we can actually minimize hair removal, but uh, uh, this is kind of a long incision, but um, we didn't have to take out any hair. You can see the hair coming right there. 
So cosmetically, she looks, she looked like she had a facelift. And basically, so you, it's all about really, you know, like I said, when I say dumbing down, these these are very powerful tools. These frames, uh, you know, they've been around for you know over half a century, but they can get you where you want to go through very small openings. You know, you can do a twist drill. In the case of DBS, we do a full burr hole, and you can hit your target within a millimeter. Uh, so mastering this is critical. Uh, I think there's a lot of error that we introduce as surgeons if we really don't know how to use this frame uh, to its uh, maximum capacity. So part of what I've been looking at with the Sleep DBS is maximizing the accuracy of this device. Because in the lab, it's like you know, 0.2 mil. It's, it's tiny, uh, the error. But in humans, uh, we start seeing larger error. And that can be for various reasons. But I think part of it is also just how we handle the thing. Keep going, drop, dropping the leads. And then this is kind of this kind of endpoint. So we want to do it safe and then our surrogate for good clinical outcomes, right? How do you predict that what you see in surgery is going to result in a good outcome? Accuracy is one of them. And there's a lot, there's a very it's a very nuanced uh, uh, debate with a lot of assumptions of old uh, when talking about this, but we're basically using stereotactic accuracy as our surrogate, as our proxy for good uh, outcomes. And again, here's here we are scanning uh, with the um, uh, Lexel uh, frame still in place. Uh, this is uh, when the serotonin is down. I'll use the O arm. Actually, now I have a body tome at both hospitals. Uh, and then here's the, the Lexel arc is still in place here. Uh, I've actually put a little uh, bovi, b uh, bipolar uh, sleeve on top of the Lexel frame to protect the lead, or you can drape the uh, the body tome itself. And this is the uh, this is kind of the picture. Again, this is the endpoint right here. Is getting a picture. You can see here. This is the um, uh, the four uh, DBS contacts are labeled here. Uh, this is the uh, a proton density scan that now I use for, uh, uh, for GPI. And here's my error, uh, 0.5 millimeters off. That's a radial error. And then you can see kind of hitting the sweet spot right here uh, that we're kind of at that spot that Phil Starr was illustrated in that paper of his. So combining direct targeting and intraoperative imaging is what allows us to consider doing this operation under general anesthesia without microelectric recording, without test stimulation, and patients don't have to be off medication. Another thing we found, uh, and I think we're seeing this also with the, uh, the ClearPoint experience, is uh, this idea that brain shift and pneumocephalus, uh, we don't have to get, there, there are techniques that we can use to minimize air. This is considered a lot of air for me, but you, know, you should see some of these pictures that people have of uh, pneumocephalus associated with DBS surgery. But we're not seeing with sleep, uh, there's a lot of steps that we, we were taking that, uh, you know, using fibrin glue, uh, using uh, sharp tip cannulas, not actually seeing the brain itself, but uh, just uh, puncturing through the dura, uh, only as big of a hole as we need to uh, introduce the, uh, the, the um, cannula. So uh, this is the experience. We're doing about 55% asleep, 45% uh, uh, awake. Uh, this is uh, 675 leads and 365 patients. Every uh, contact I've placed, uh, I have a picture. This is a snapshot of contact one on the left side. Uh, we're big GPI. I think we're swinging back to STN. It's, we didn't like, decide it would be GPI, but about half my leads are GPI. Uh, and the others include like, things like fornix and uh, posterior septlamic area. Uh, complications. We had three infections in the first 40 patients uh, in none since. Um, and this is our error. So this is compared to uh, Birchall and Stars of Sleep cases. Uh, we've placed 381 leads uh, under general anesthesia, and our radial error is 0.9 millimeters. So we're, we're hitting the target. We started doing this surgery all at once, meaning that the battery goes in at the same time as the, the, the brain leads. And this is what we're scheduling the surgeries for now. So uh, between two and a half hours and four hours uh, to place two leads. This is with MER and placing the battery. Uh, we schedule that for four hours, and usually we get out sooner than that. So we've, uh, again, the, the goal is, you know, we know the patients like us, but, you know, they don't want to keep coming back for surgery. So we try to minimize uh, the amount of times that, you know, you can do this operation four stages. One lead, come back two weeks for your battery. Come back six months later, get your other lead, come back two weeks later for your battery. Uh, we try to uh, avoid that. Again, I think that's how we're trying to move to prime time with this. Uh, outcomes are the key. You know, we can have safety outcomes, but are we actually meeting the metrics uh, expected for DBS surgery? Are we able to, on stimulation, 
elevate that off period uh, significantly so patients are having fewer fluctuations. So we do six month UPRS testing. This is where we stand a couple months ago. You can see a, we have a lot of asleep patients with GPI. So we have a paper coming out in JNS uh, where we show our um, six month outcomes with improvement in UPRS of 40.3%. And you can see again, this is kind of the metric. This is how we, we show that DBS is effective, that UPRS testing, we're able to raise that off state with the stimulation on. And uh, this is what we see with the VA trial, 25, 28%. And uh, that's a blinded, we weren't blinded, neither was Ostrom's group from UCSF, uh, where we're getting better um, uh, improvements. So uh, kind of the theme here is, does our ability to verify that we hit our target intraoperatively, something that we've not been able to do in the past, and our threshold for making a revision is lower because we're not, we haven't even started closing yet. So if we're, if we're like, you know, even 1.7 millimeters, sometimes we'll say, you know what, we're a bit close to the internal capsule, let's, let's move that one. Uh, does that reduce our reliance upon MER and test stimulation? I'm doing more cases looking at MER in a sleep patients to see how our uh, targeting and how our pictures uh, uh, compare to what we see in recordings, and, and they match up pretty well. If I move anterior, that doesn't mean I'm moving anterior on the scan. It means I'm correcting for a posterior deflection. So more often than not, when I decide based on MER to reposition a lead, I'm actually correcting for a stereotactic error. So DBS is a well-established therapy. Anatomical targeting challenges some of the tenets of awake surgery. This is something that's a bit controversial still, uh, but I think it's true. Uh, and a sleep DBS may render therapy more accessible. Uh, Dr. Birchall uh, really went you know, head first with this. He, um, he does all his surgeries asleep now. It's interesting, if you do a fellowship with Dr. Birchall, you're learning what's technically off-label surgery because they're not doing any awake surgeries there. And uh, let's see. Uh, yep. And yep, thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Motor outcomes? No. Just the stereotactic yes. outcomes. Just the error, the uh, stereotactic data. They have it coming. So. Do you do any um, like uh, macro stimulation with the sleep patients with GPI or anything else? Do, I do. do you so incorporate I incorporate that. I um, uh, I enjoy MER. So you know, especially when you know, it's kind of like you know enjoying your steak. You don't want to scarf down your steak. So sometimes I'm like, hey, let's do let's do a track. Let's see what we see. Uh, let's do. It. And especially asleep, you can kind of take your time with the residents, and uh, and it, we're, because we know we're going to get out of there by noon anyway, we'll take time and we'll do some recordings. And so what I'll do is um, uh, with these leads, uh, you know, I think part of this is also how to make sure you're not making any assumptions how you do this. Don't trust the hardware. We always do an impedance check, you know, which we do with test stimulation. You don't want to find out when you're putting the battery in that you put a busted lead in. So when we do the impedance check, now we just started this, uh, we'll ramp up the voltage, we'll go straight, straight to like six volts and make sure that we're not getting capsular side effects. Because what'll burn you is low thresholds for capsular side effects. You know, if you're far away from the internal capsule, you shouldn't see them, but we'll, we'll check that out. Um, in asleep patients, just making sure that we see capsular side effects by say eight, 10 volts, but not, you want to see them, but just not too early. Cause if you don't see them, you may be throwing an air ball. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I think we're learning more and more that, you know, intraoperative imaging is great, but it's not a necessary substitute for testing physiology. I mean, right. to me, ideally, like, you know, you saying before, we'd want to do both and everybody. Yeah, and I, the residents will be like, hey, you know, when I'm doing this sleep MER, like, does this mean we won't have to do that second scan? I'm like, you know, ask me that question in, you know, 45 minutes when you see how we're interpreting the recordings and then what we see on CT. Yeah. And more often than not, the CT tells the story. Yeah. And so it's like, all right, why do we, you know, the resident says, why, why are we doing all this recording? And it's not all this, you know, the tracks take only like seven minutes when the neurosurgeon's driven. Um, but uh, for me, it's more instructive to see kind of, you know, how far are we going down to get to SNR? You know, sometimes we're hitting the bottom of the target, you know, five, six millimeters beyond the minus four plane. Uh, so, what, you know, what should we be targeting at the, uh, you know, the, the 12, three, four area target, you know, contact one, contact two.